welcome to the session, The Personal Statement, Strategies for Supporting Students. My name is Yvette Galat. I'm Director of K-12 and Community Initiatives at the UC Office of the President, and I'm happy to present to you one of my favorite sessions on the personal statement. And as we go through, I know that there will be many questions that you'll have about the information presented. I'd like for you to hold your questions until the end. And with that, let's begin. We're going to talk about five things this morning. We'll go over the purpose of the personal statement in UC admissions. And then we'll do a case study. We'll actually look at a reading and writing process together and talk about that a little bit. We'll review the new instructions and questions for this year. And then I'll share with you some writing strategies for students and some feedback strategies that you can use to help your students prepare more effective personal statements. Start with the purpose. Why does the university require the personal statement? Why do they put the students through this kind of agony? Well, a number of reasons, which I hope will resonate with you. The first is that the personal statement is part of UC's comprehensive review process. This is our ability to get to know the student, to understand his or her accomplishments in context, his or her achievements in context, his or her obstacles and challenges in context. In that way, it's an opportunity for the student to provide information to us that supports and augments that review process, for them to be able to anticipate the questions that we will have and respond to them appropriately in the personal statement. A good personal statement will help the readers know and understand the student. And in your, in your assistance to students, if when you're reading applications and personal statements at the end of the day, you don't know or understand the student any better, then perhaps it's an opportunity to move that student in a different direction. But at the end, we should know and understand that student better than we would with just the application alone. The personal statement adds clarity, depth, and meaning to the information collected in other parts of the application. It deepens it for us, it clarifies, it contextualizes. It doesn't repeat, it doesn't give us in a narrative form what we have in, in, in the little boxes in the application. It actually contextualizes and deepens that. In that sense, it completes the application for admission. Counselors and students often ask, well, you know, is it, is, what, what's a good topic? What's a, what's a unique thing that my students or, or I should be writing about? The perfect topic is the one that completes that application. The perfect topic, the most unique topic, is the one that completes that application. Students should understand that the application and the personal statement talk to each other. They each talk to us, and together they can dialogue. And when they do that, an admission reader has a sense that that application is complete. So there are no unique topics. There's nothing your student's going to be able to, to pull out that's going to just wow us in terms of its topic. What wows us, what completes it, is the sense that we have a, a better understanding of that student, we know that student on a deeper level than we might have otherwise. And an admission decision is never based on the content of the personal statement alone. A student of mine for, from a couple of years ago wrote about uh, feeding herself, eating toilet paper, in lieu of food because she needed to have enough food for her own brothers and sisters to eat. And it was a heart-wrenching story and it was very moving. And it was accompanied with a transcript riddled with D's and F's. So it's not enough to tell us a hardship story. It's not enough to uh, give us uh, problems that a student has had. We have to see that a student is trying to achieve academically in light of his or her circumstances. And when we don't see that, then the application and the essay aren't dialoguing with each other and then they're not complete. And then finally, a message from our faculty. While it is acceptable to receive feedback or helpful suggestions, applicants' personal statements should reflect their own ideas and be written by them alone. Students will often see this as a discouragement from our, our faculty. They should see this as our faculty's attempt to empower them, our faculty's belief that they can accomplish this exercise and do so very well. It doesn't preclude help, but it wants to put help in the right context. And I think as we go through the day, you'll, you'll see, and I hope you can convey to your students, that going to essays.com and, and downloading the 2999 personal statement isn't going to help if it doesn't complete that application. Looking at other people's personal statements and deciding that that's the topic that got someone admitted or that's the writing style that worked isn't going to help that student. What we're really looking for is the student's authentic voice his or her authentic response, and our faculty are encouraging that here. 
So let's look at a case study. In your binder, following the PowerPoint of this presentation, you're going to see an essay. You see at the top of it this year's new prompt for one of the essays. Describe the world you come from. For example, your family, community, or school. And tell us how your world has shaped your dreams and aspirations. And then you have an essay that follows. What I'd like for you to do is read that. And you just have a couple of minutes, because our admission readers only have a couple of minutes. And in reading it, I want you to consider, and we'll talk about briefly, what's important to this applicant, what qualities and characteristics define this applicant, which of these is most prominent, what appeals to you, do you like this essay? So has everyone found it? Okay. Well, then go ahead and read and take about, about two minutes. Okay, what's important to this applicant? Family? Anything else? Education, Education getting a college degree? Other things? Improving life for herself and her family? Her community? Pleasing her parents? Okay. Being true to herself? Escaping poverty, self-sacrifice, self a lot going on there, huh, in just those 678 words. What qualities or characteristics define this applicant? Perseverance. Perseverance. How do you know that? OK, because she's, been, she, she's seen people who are not as ambitious as she is, and she doesn't want to fall under their spell. So she recognizes that difference between um, her way of approaching education and the way her friends have. But she doesn't tell us. She, she tells us she makes statements about being perse about per persevering, but she doesn't show us how that. OK. Other characteristics that define her? Well, let's stay on the topic of characteristics that define her. She's mature, so she's perse she perseveres and she's mature from, from what she tells us in her, in her essay. I'm sorry? Okay, so she's part of an immigrant family and she tells us that without uh, being really overt in her description of that, okay? Caring and obedient toward her family. 
goal-oriented. What are her goals? To go to college. Okay. Um, does anything stand out about her for you? Of all of those characteristics and all of those things that are important to her, is there any one thing that distinguishes her in your mind? Her loyalty to her parents is, is striking. Okay. Other things? Okay, she's a first generation student, so that stands out to you. Her ability to overcome peer pressure in her environment and to recognize the differences between her ambitions and those of her of her peers. Right here. She wants change for her community. Okay. All right. Do you like this essay? No. Oh, good. Okay. Anyone like it? Let's see who likes it. Okay, no waffling here. You have to like it or not like it. How many like it? Okay. How many don't like it? How many have no opinion? Oh, a few. Okay. Well, hold on to this. We're going to come back to this in a minute. Let's move on and talk about the new instructions and the prompts for this year. This year, students have two questions to respond to. You've seen one of them with the sample essay, and you'll see the other in a moment. Students are expected to respond to both questions. They should stay within the 1,000-word total, although they can go over a little bit. Should they? No. Why on earth would they? This is an assignment, right, with constraints. So when you go to work and your boss says, come up with a new counseling program, but there's no new money, you have to do it within those constraints, right? Students have constraints here. Can they write a thousand words? Absolutely. But not if they start writing a thousand words. They should write an entire essay and edit back. They can choose the length of each response. So a response could be 700 words, and another one could be uh, 300 words, 600, 400, however they want to divide it. Now, they should make that decision strategically, not based on how they want to spend their writing time, but on what issues surface in that application that they really need to explore. OK? Uh, 250 words is about 3 quarters of a page. Anything less than that is unlikely to give us a, a, an essay that helps us know and understand a student better. So they shouldn't write less than 250 words, although they're free to choose how they spend their time. For those students that you have, those high achieving students who say, well, I have amazing grades and I have amazing test scores, why on earth do I have to spend my time here? Have them keep in mind that our scholarship committees also read these. Our donors and our faculty who make decisions about um, scholarships and other kinds of, of support for students, these essays matter to them too. So every student should be taking this, taking this seriously. Let's look at the prompts. You saw the first one. Describe the world you come from. For example, your family, your community, or school. And tell us how your world has shaped your dreams and aspirations. Describe the world you come from. For example, your family, community, or school. And tell us how your world has shaped your dreams and aspirations. A student's world doesn't have to be their family, their community, or their school. They can describe it and define it however they wish. These are examples for us. They're examples to help guide them to give them some direction. But they're not exclusive. They don't have to write about any of those things. Their world could be their bedroom, for example. There are two parts here to describe the world they come from and tell us how the world has shaped dreams and aspirations, which means they have to define those dreams and aspirations to some degree. They need to balance how they respond here. Our sample essay, she's a fairly good writer, right? She's pretty sophisticated, fluid prose, but she takes the prompt literally. She writes a paragraph about her family a paragraph about her community, and a paragraph about her school. She mixes it up a little, switches the order, but essentially she writes on all three. As a result, we don't really know much about her. We know that she has dreams and aspirations, but we don't know what they are. We know that her friends want to be surgeons and lawyers, but we have no idea what she wants to be. So they want to be mindful that there are two parts here and not to focus all of their attention on half of the sentence. They should choose one, that or is deliberate, and, and tell us something that really helps us know and understand them, that con contextualizes them. Which one of these resonates most prominently? Of course, they have experiences and aspirations that are shaped by all of them, but they need to be strategic and pick, because they want to have a deep essay, not a superficial one that, that scratches the surface of three different topics. 
I'll skip over transfer. Prompt two, tell us about a personal quality, talent, accomplishment, contribution, or experience that is important to you. What about this quality or accomplishment makes you proud, and how does it relate to the person you are? All right. Now this one just sends deep, deep, deep waves of anxiety through students because they absolutely have no talents, no accomplishments, and no experiences. Well, that's not actually true. One of the problems, I think, is that they read this as a whole and they say, I have to have all of these things. But they don't. They just have to have one. Again, there's an or. And some of your students will have amazing talents. You know who they are. Some of them will have had amazing experiences, made great contributions. Others of them won't have lots of extracurricular activities and leadership. Do you have those kinds of students? Well, ask those students how they spend a day. Maybe they go home after school and instead of participating in glee club, they actually pick up their younger brothers and sisters, take them home, make sure they have a snack, dinner, house is cleaned, homework's done. Those students exhibit extraordinary responsibility, right? Extraordinary resilience organizational skills, the ability to manage their own time as well as others, those are equally important qualities for us. We want the extroverted leaders, but also the quiet leaders, okay? So with those students, if they think they absolutely have nothing, try asking them to describe their day, and I think you'll see that some personal qualities exhibit that, that, that they exhibit that they can capitalize on here. The additional comments box has been expanded this year to 500 words. And in this box, they can describe anything that they haven't had an opportunity to include elsewhere in the application. This is not a default third essay, and not every student will have additional comments. Now, you want to dissuade the students who want to just go on and on from one of the prompts into the additional comments box. We don't want bleed overs, OK? Um, examples of things that would fit here, additional names, Visa issues, if they've taken additional interla international baccalaureate classes, exams, and they don't fit in the boxes, this is a place for that, OK? But this is not the place to write another essay. They may only have a sentence. They may have 500 words. Now, in a previous counselor conference, one of the counselors asked about a student she had who had started this new club. And we weren't going to recognize the club because it was so brand new, so innovative, so amazing that it was just never been seen before. And she'd spent a lot of time with school boards and faculty and district officials to get her club started, and she'd done all of these things to get the club going, and it had really transformed this particular aspect of the school. And she wanted to know if that should fit in the additional comments. What do you think? No, that's an essay. That's an essay that might have something to do with a contribution or experience or accomplishment that's really transformed a student, OK? So students should be strategic here. What goes in the additional comments? They won't all have something. So they shouldn't see it as, oh, there's a blank box. I have to fill it in. They may not have anything. All right, so let's talk about some writing strategies for students. What are some of the things that they can do to produce an effective personal statement? There are four steps to a personal statement, and only the last one has to do with writing one. How many of you have students who have started? OK, stop. <laughs> We're going to have them stop. The very, very first thing that a student should do when, when beginning to write a personal statement is to gather information. They should gather the information that they will use to complete their application. The grades, their test scores, their extracurricular activities, their community service, their employment, et cetera. And they should create the text that we will read. They should create the text that we will read. Once they've gathered all of that information, they should read it critically. They should read it as we would read it. And this means applying some critical reading strategies to the application itself, asking questions of it that are similar to the kind of questions that admission readers ask and that students are perfectly capable of asking themselves. Once they've read that critically and they have some sense of the interpretations that can be made, the observations that can be formed, and the questions that can be asked, the student should develop a topic, which is a response to the prompt, and a thesis which is a point of view on the prompt. Now, students, if they write literally to the prompt, will end up being very superficial because they write to the examples we give them as opposed to their own topics, OK? So we want them to develop their own topic. Our prompts are broad, and they're broad because we want to make sure that every student has a way into them. 
But every student will have a perspective that we want them to draw out. And a topic and a point of view will help them do that. And then once they've created their application, they've read it, they've asked questions of it, the kind of deep questions that get to meaning and significance and begin to define the applicant for us. They've developed a topic that responds to the prompt and a point of view on that topic. That's when they draft. They draft, they get their feedback, and they revise. So writing a personal statement actually has as much to do with reading as it does with writing. So if your students haven't been reading that application or don't have that application completed, they should stop writing because they don't have the text to which their essay responds. I think that high school students are challenged in doing this for a number of reasons. It doesn't matter what socioeconomic class they're from, what privileges they have. They all seem to struggle with this, and I think it's because they've never really experienced college-level writing. And yet, who writes prompts? Faculty, right? And faculty are steeped in college norms and college expectations. And so I want to show you the parallels between writing for college and writing for the personal statement that can help students understand this perhaps not as their last high school writing assignment, but maybe as their first college one. So in college, students are asked to write for an unknown audience, right? Their faculty will tell them, write for a community of scholars. Do you remember that when you were in college? You would write these essays and you would say, well, what's wrong with it? They'd say, well, you're writing to me. Write to a community of scholars. Well, think about the personal statement. Who are students writing to? Are they writing to you? Are they writing to their teachers? No, they're writing to an unknown audience. They can know some things about that audience, but they essentially don't know those people. Think about high school. The good students know exactly what teachers want, and they know exactly how to write to it. But this assignment asks them to do something slightly different. In college, students will determine their own topics. They may read Hamlet and be asked to write an essay on Hamlet, but they have to determine the topic that they'll approach Hamlet in. How will they look at it? There are many interpretations, many perspectives on Hamlet. Which one will they take? In the personal statement, we have a huge prompt, right? Designed for everybody to find a way in, but they have to develop their topic. In high school, though, their teachers will say, Write an essay in which you discuss the relationship between Laertes and Polonius in Hamlet. And they'll write to that because they were told to do that. But here we need them to make a topic of their own. Family, school, and community is big. They need to narrow that down and make their own topic. And then in college, we want them to dig deep. We want them to be analytical and reflective as writers. We want them to apply thoughtfulness and careful critique. More is not better in college. Same thing with the personal statement. We want them to be analytical and reflective in a thousand words. More is not better. But in high school, if a three-page paper on the relationship between Laertes and Polonius will get you a B, a five-page paper will get you an A. And so they're accustomed to sort of doing more, going beyond, in order to get better grades. But here we really want them to focus, write for the, write for the topic that responds to the prompt, Okay, so do you see that there are a lot of parallels, maybe more parallels to college writing than high school writing? And if they think of it that way, they might be maybe open to taking a few more risks, trying some different things as, as part of their writing process here. What are some things that is, are important for them to do? Uh, write about special circumstances. We want them to tell us about special circumstances that influence them. If they're older and returning to school, especially for transfer students, that's important for us to know. If they attend smaller alternative learning environments, that's important for us to know, or if they've been homeschooled. If they have any learning or physical challenges that have influenced who they are, how they've developed the opportunities that they've had, we want to know that. And if they're veterans, we want to know that as well. They should understand that reading is as important as writing here, that they can think like admission readers and they can capitalize on the relationships between readers and writers. That a writing process is very important brainstorming, drafting, revising, revising for clarity, organization and meaning, and proofreading. And then finally, to get good feedback, not the kind of feedback that hands you an essay on November 28th and asks you if it's good, but the kind of feedback that is part of the writing process that really helps elevate the, uh, the quality of the personal statement that they produce. What does it mean to think like an admission reader? Well, it means this. Every reader, you did it this morning when you read the paper, Every reader does it every time you read it when you, you did it when you read the agenda for today. You ask questions, 
You make observations and you form interpretations of everything you read, don't you? Well, writers can fulfill readers' expectations by anticipating those questions, those interpretations, and those observations. And they can do that with their applications. If they complete that application and they read it, then they can have a better sense of what admission readers are expecting to see in the response. It's not a secret. But students have to ask a lot of different kinds of questions. They tend to ask one kind of question, and if they stay at one kind of question, they won't get deep, and they, won't, they'll, they will stay superficial. We want them to go beyond that. So there are three kinds of questions that any reader generally asks about the things that they read. Level one questions are facts, right? The answers to level one questions are evident in the text. So a level one question about the application might be, where did the student go to school? What classes did the student take? Right? What, what, what clubs did the student participate in? Answers to level one questions are details and paragraphs. They have a place, but it's not the most central place. So if students understand that as their, as, as their role, they'll begin to see that, okay, those questions aren't deep enough for me to begin to use those as topics. Level two questions are interpretive. They take information from parts of the application and make an interpretation of that information. So let's say we saw a student whose grades dropped um, and a job was, uh, was picked up and an interpretation might be, well, maybe work was more important than school. Maybe the student wouldn't want us to make that interpretation. So he can use the personal statement as an opportunity to deepen our understanding of, of that employment if he so chose. Answers to level two questions are topic sentences. Better than paragraph evidence, but not yet high enough. Level three questions address meaning and significance. They define the theme of the application. So they go beyond the application to explain why something matters. So let's say we had a student, um, I'll use a transfer example. She's a single mom and she's taking community college classes at a lot of different colleges and she works, but she's maintained this extraordinary uh, GPA and this extraordinary persistence. A question we might have is, why is education so important to her? Well, the personal statement is an opportunity for her to tell us why. Not just tell us what she's done, but why it matters. And so level three questions, those deeper questions, are thesis statements. They can begin to define the theme of an application. So one of the things that I do with students is I have them complete their application, and then I ask them to ask levels of questions. Ask level one questions, level two questions, level three questions. They'll have a lot of level one questions because there's a lot of facts in their application. They'll have a few interpretive questions. Well, I need to explain this, that, or the other. And they may have one or two level three questions. Those level three questions are the themes that are emerging from their application, and they want to capitalize on them because those are the themes that admission readers are going to want to be satisfied that they have a full and complete portrait of. So let's take a look at a transcript, and you have one following the case study essay that you read. So I want you to take a look at our student, Julia Cho, and I want you to think about the kinds of questions you have for this student. And also to think about, and let's talk about, what data do you find? What patterns do you see? What questions would you ask? What inferences would you draw? And then how well does the essay align with the profile? And then let's talk about it. Take about five minutes. Also, how would you advise a student to proceed? What are her next steps?
Okay. What data do you find? What data do you find? She's a good student. Her grades tell you she's a good student, grade-wise. Good. So she, yeah, she has she has a job, and she's progressively improved in her academic performance. Over here. Okay. So she uh, struggles with math, and although she's good in foreign language, perhaps she doesn't like it so much. She didn't continue. We don't know why, but we could assume maybe she just didn't like it. Here. Okay, her test scores aren't above al average, but she has no college going history in her family. Her parents didn't go to college. And then right there. You don't have to write very well to get good grades at this school? Okay, well, okay, fair enough. We'll see. Okay, let's go over here and then over here. She has a fairly lightweight senior schedule. Three APs, but, well, remember this would only be the A through G, so she might have some other things, but perhaps, perhaps compared to other students, a, a fairly light schedule. Right here and then in the back over there. She's good in science. Very good in science. Okay? One more back here. She continually takes advanced and rigorous courses. Okay, any patterns you see here? A pattern question? Right, she could be an English language learner based on her test scores. Okay, right here, patterns that you see. Okay, so we don't really know what her, her aspirations are other than going to college. Okay, what patterns do you see here? When does she get to be a kid? She's a high achiever, right? Working at a nursing home isn't like working at the Gap, right? Probably got some bedpans and some, some elderly people to move, yeah. So it's not easy work. Wonder why that work and not the Gap in the back. Right, she may contribute to her family, and th so that's why she's working. It's not a job maybe that she has because she wants one, but because she has to. What questions do you have for her? Okay. So she may, be, she may be headed, based on her, her science focus in, in the transcript, she may be headed toward pre-med or interested in helping people. Right, based on the sort of the, the, the pattern of work and, and school and... and, and um, test interest. Okay, one more. Is she lying? Yeah. Did she write it? Yeah, good question. Did she write it compared to the, the writing score? So that's a question. What other questions do you have of this applicant? What's her career interest? Over here. Where's her community service? Did she have choices she had to make? Right? She has the nursing home, but where's her what else has she done? Maybe she hasn't done anything else, and if so, why? Oh, to, yeah. It, right, and she has another test, test planned, and if I understand it right, when did she take her test? March, and uh, swimming is a spring sport, so maybe it was a, a pressure thing, so she's taking it again, right here. Give her a break. She seems like she's a darn good student. Yeah. Okay. Um, those of you who like this essay, do you like it still? You still like it? Still does enough for you? Answers the questions you have about this applicant? Helps you know and understand this applicant better? They're asking them to tell them specifically the major, but sort of, you know, what their interests are, you know, and why they've made the choices that they've made, and, 
you know, there, there's a part of this essay that talks about struggle. Do you remember in the beginning, she's struggling against something? She says, my parents want, her, want me to be something and I'm, I want to be my own person. In, in that space, what is it she wants? She's clearly defined it as different than what her family wants, but she doesn't tell us what it is. Perhaps her family is pushing that, that science direction, and perhaps she wants something else. She doesn't have to say it's, it's precisely this, but she has to give us some indication of where, what it is, what interests her. Maybe it's music. Maybe she discovered something in music that she wants to pursue. The, the most important thing is we don't know. Okay. Yeah, so maybe that's the theme of her essay, is helping others. And, you know, talks to us about what that means for her. Yeah. Okay. At, undeclared is a popular major at UC. Okay. It's not about the major. It's not about the major. It's about your interests, your aspirations. Okay. But for those of you, I'm going to hold those questions for a moment. For those of you who liked the essay, do you still think it answers your questions? You had a lot of them. Do you think, are you satisfied as readers that you feel this is a complete package? You know and understand this student better as a result? Or are there enough questions remaining that leave you with a sense of being disconnected? I'm just curious. You can like it. It's okay. I just want to hear. It doesn't, it doesn't enhance her application. It sort of wisps away, right? You have a sense that she's determined and she wants to go to college, but outside of that, you don't know anything about her. You know, her friends want to be surgeons and lawyers and that her, her family has had some struggles and she wants to go to college and make things different, but you don't know. And that's typical, I think, of a lot of students. But there's enough information in this application that could take her in a different direction. Right here, one more, and then let's move on. Okay, keep in mind that we're giving them a prompt, not a topic. We're giving them a prompt, not a topic. They need to define a topic. By defining a topic that connects these two documents, I think that's where the student gives that sense of completion. We need to move on because of time, so I'll ask you to hold those until we move to questions. Um, the purpose of this exercise is not to discuss whether the student would be admitted, is competitive. It's to show you that the application talks to us too. The application talks to us too. And you all had an extraordinary number of questions and observations about this applicant. If your students could understand those kinds of questions, could they write better essays? Could they write better essays that are directed and focused and address the prompts through their own topics unique to their applications? So that was the purpose, was to have you see an essay in isolation and then see that essay in context. And if it, if it changes the way you think about what the essay does, all the better. All right, let's move on. Writing process, what do we want students to do? Read the application using the levels of questions, asking those different kinds of questions. If we just asked this one kind of question on that application, would we have gotten to some of the interpretations and some of the meaning that you were attempting to derive? Probably not. So we want students to ask a lot of different kinds of questions. Factual questions, interpretive questions, meaning questions. Create their drafts and get feedback from you and from others, giving you at least a week to respond because you're busy people. And that's just a little plug for you because we know you're busy and you get a lot of these. Uh, when students are revising, to revise for organization, clarity, and meaning, Okay, how many of you on, on Julia's sample essay made notes in the margins about maybe grammar, syntax, a better way to say anything? Anyone do that? Circle things you liked? Okay. When faced with a plethora of choices for revising, students generally choose the easy one, which is to correct their grammar, mostly because you've done it for them. You've marked all the comma splices in the fragments. Uh, so what you get back is generally a corrected version of the same thing. Keep in mind that revision is from the Latin to, to re-see. Okay, we want students to re-see their essay. And we want to challenge them to keep their revision 
on the level, on a higher level, not just in correcting sentences. Also, you know, for those of you who don't like Julia's essay at the end, and you would advise her to start afresh, what would have happened to all of your state district paid for red ink? You've been wasted, right? Because you would have put it on paper that we're just gonna throw away. And then finally, in the final version, proofread. Now for those of you working with second language students, you may, you may say, but they're English, you know, they need help with proofreading earlier. Um, the, the, the truth is that what, what happens when we proofread these early drafts is that they focus on their English and we want them to focus on their ideas. So the more we can get them to focus on their ideas and say proofreading for that final draft that's going to go into the readers, I think the better for students. And it also, it preserves their own agency over their work. Okay, so what can you do? Help them understand the role of the personal statement in the admissions process, help them understand that we do read it, that other people other than admission readers may read it as well, and so it really is an opportunity for them, not something they should feel anxious about or try to dismiss as unimportant. That there is a relationship between readers and writers, there's a relationship between readers and writers that students can understand and capitalize on, that a personal statement is as much about reading as it is about writing. You had a lot to say about some little boxes a moment ago. You had a lot to say about a few little boxes on a page. That a writing process is important, that if they think about this as gathering information, right, reading critically, developing a topic and a thesis, drafting, getting feedback and revising, it's probably a little bit longer than a couple of days. It might actually be a couple of weeks and they should plan for that. And then to get appropriate feedback. There's all kinds of feedback that they can get. How do they get good feedback? First, when, when students are approaching you about this and they ask you to read, ask for the application and the personal statement, not just the personal statement. Does it make a difference for you to see the application here than it is to just see the essay? Just seeing the essay, it's a good fine essay. She can rock a semicolon, right? She's a pretty fluid writer. You know, she's, she's persevering, you know. It's a nice essay on its own. In context, it might be something different. So ask for the application and the personal statement, not just the personal statement. Ask them to provide a list of, student, of questions they would like you to answer. I think one of the things that, that may happen with this prompt, particularly the new one, the first one, is that students will focus on the first part of that question because they don't like to talk about themselves. And so one of the questions they may need to ask you is, have I talked about myself enough? Do you have enough of a sense of who I am in the context of my family or in the context of my community or in the context of my school? Or do you just know about my school, my family, or my community? When you're commenting, again, commenting on their ideas and the level of persuasiveness, not the grammar, let's keep them focused and challenged on meaning and ideas. And then finally, help students find readers who resemble their target audience. Who's their target audience? Adults, but what about those adults? They're very complicated adults. Well, we know, we know a couple of things about them, right? We call them admission readers, not rejection readers, right? Okay, so they're probably good people, college educated people, interested in students being successful, perhaps. Okay, so are you the best reader for your students? What else are those readers that we know are very compassionate and interested in students? What else are they to the student? They are strangers. They are strangers. So the more the students can have an objective read from strangers, the better. So perhaps you're not the best reader for your students, but maybe your colleague at another school is, and maybe you all can swap. Because if students can get to that, you know, if someone who, does someone who doesn't know me know and understand me from this packet, that's a really good, that's a really good um, experience for them to have. Okay, and it resembles the experience that they'll have in the actual reading process. Are any of you parents with children applying this year? You're not to help. You are to stay out of the process entirely. You are completely useless to your children. <laughs> you are unable to be objective about your young person. Okay, and you're a wonderful parent, probably a great counselor, but in this process, you will be in the way and interfere. So find, find a stranger but you're not to help. All right, well that concludes my remarks to you. What questions do you have? I'll go over here, I had you earlier, and then over here. Yeah. 
the question is the concern about the first prompt and whether it's going to elicit the feedback that we are hoping that it does. And the second prompt, the word proud may just lead to a sort of a narrative list of things they're proud of. Um, the first question for those of you who, who counsel students who go to a wide variety of, of colleges may seem familiar to you because it's used by a lot of colleges and universities around the country and they believe that it elicits, it, it gives that kind of response. We also did focus groups on these questions with students and the students really liked them. They thought these questions really helped them say who, what they were about. I agree that there are concerns about the way it's worded. That's why the emphasis on developing their own topic that's responsive not writing just to the prompt. I think where, where the problems are going to occur is when students write just to the prompt. So the more we can help them understand that there's a topic of their own that they can write to that will answer and respond to this prompt, the better. The second one, the narrative list is a common problem in the essays. And again, I think it's about developing topics, understanding these not as topics in and of themselves, but opportunities to write for which specific topics that respond are important. And that is, that, that's, that's a way of thinking about the prompt that we need as, as counselors and, and teachers and others interested in helping our students succeed, need to educate them on. But I, I, do, I do think the students thought that this was a really good question. They liked it a lot and they felt that they could really write on it. There was one back here and then to the front. Right there, yes. Every campus has a different reading process, and you'll find that described in your, in your uh, binder. There's a grid. It's very important that students write for the most comprehensive read. And the reason for that is that they apply to multiple campuses, and it's not possible for them to write to any one campus. So the default should be, I should assume that my package is going to be read by, in, in its entirety. And many of the campuses do hire readers who are counselors. Some of you may be readers in the room. Um, and, and, and augment our, our reading staff that way. And all of our readers are trained and normed in a reading process. In the front here and then over there. The question is whether it's adequate to talk mostly about dreams or aspirations rather than their world. I think it's, I, I'm sorry. To talk more about their world than dreams or aspirations. I think there should be a balance that students should strive for balance here, and that's part of the, the, the feedback that, that you would give them. If it's not balanced, the context is important, but the context is a catalyst for something else. We're not admitting your mom, we're not admitting your friend, we're admitting you. So the student needs to be at the center of that response. So how important are the dreams and aspirations? They have, to, they have to address dreams and aspirations. They have to have something that they're, they're striving for and working for. They have to have something they want. It doesn't have to be very specific. It doesn't have to be deep, like, this is the major I want. But there's something they've enjoyed doing. There's something that's helped them say, you know, I aspire to help my community. You know, that kind of thing is perfectly fine. That's an aspiration, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have to be, you know, and I'm going to do it by studying, you know, global economies. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that specific, but it does have to have that sense that I have something I'm trying to do, something I see myself doing. They want to prepare for, right, right. And then this side, yes. The question is, why would we lose the rationale this year? I believe our faculty felt and our admissions directors felt that the rationale didn't help us enhance the, um, the quality of the responses. It doesn't, pre I mean, you know, generally we're still looking for the same thing. So those of you who are veterans in the room who have those, I mean, it doesn't really change about what we're looking for. But we want, but the rationale didn't help the students, may have intimidated them a little bit more than we wanted it to. Of course, you know, if it, if it turns out that your feedback to us in, in various forums tells us that we need to bring that back, or that becomes important, I'd like to advise that we wait and see. Okay, that we wait and see. Did I get this one here? No, I, I, okay, over here. Well, that's really going to de depend on the students. So some of the examples that have come up from other conferences have been, well, you know, my, this student received a D 
in this class? Should he include that in the additional comments or an essay? Well, it depends, right? If the D had something to do with one's dreams, aspirations, and community, then it should be an essay. If it's simply, I got a D, and you ought to know I got a D for these reasons, it might be additional comments, okay? Same thing with physical illness. If physical illness had something to do that was transformative, helped the student understand something differently, then include it in the essay. If it's, I was sick and I missed a semester of school, include in the additional comments. But really, the students, the students' own circumstances are going to, to drive that, okay? One more, and then we have to depart. Then she should make a topic to that, to that respect. And again, I, mean, I think the cultural issues are really important, and I think there are students who really don't like to talk about themselves. They have to talk about themselves. They're going to do it for their entire lives. They have to do it. So this isn't about trying to remove that responsibility. Before you go, just one thing. There are those of you in the room who say, this is great, this is wonderful, there's no way I'm going to do this. We do have a tutorial online. It's at californiacolleges.edu. And you can see Michael Burton out at the table. He's tabling here at the, the conference. And he'll be able to show you where it is. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.